Thank you, everybody. I wasn't expecting people from all over the world to be coming, which is brilliant. Um, apologies for to some of you if you're because uh, this may be quite UK centric, but I may actually I make no apology for that because uh, uh, you know the, the UK fauna is amazing, and of course it's a lot of Braconids. Uh, a lot of Braconids we'll be talking about are actually found all over the world, so it's really generally applicable. Uh, this is a presentation which is uh, based in large part on uh, a couple of workshops that Mark Shaw and I have, have run in the past. And Mark compiled loads of really nice uh, photos and notes from his own um, rearings of, of Braconid wasps. And uh, I've, uh, so yeah, so we've sort of uh, in the past sort of taken a sort of joint approach where uh, I cover some more of the identification and Mark covers more of the biology. Uh, but I'll be doing it. So I'll be making a hash of uh, what Mark usually says today. But for kind of wasps, instead of a wasp on the slide, I've actually got a, um, a caterpillar here, a mummified caterpillar with a big emergent hole in it. Um, just to point out, oh yeah, so I think uh, we sent, Liana uh, suggested I do a poll. So I, there are some poll questions, which I hope people will um, will answer about whether you've actually reared uh wasps from caterpillars before or any other host and whether you've had experience in identifying braconid wasps so it'd be great to hear uh of people's experience with these thanks liana so because here is a, a fluffy caterpillar which is sort of how i first got into parasitoid wasps which was rearing caterpillars and often of course you're lucky enough that a um that a wasp comes out rather than a moth or a butterfly and it's particularly Aliodes alternator, uh, lovely sort of uh, orangey and black uh, braconid wasps that you find in Britain that got me hooked on parasitoid wasps. So there is an Aliodes alternator mummy, which is great. Uh, I'll come on to how wasps mummify their hosts in a bit. But I suppose, first of all, what is a braconid wasp? Um, to put that into context, uh, so braconid wasps, this is uh, the family Braconidae is obviously a, a massive family of wasps. Um, there's Aliodes again, This um, you'll see quite a few pictures of Aliodes because Mark Shaw loves them. Um, but yeah, braconid wasps are one of two families in the big super family Ichneumonoidea. So if you're not familiar with Ichneumonoids, this is one of the sort of big radiations of Hymenoptera uh, and everybody should be getting into these things they are all around us but um just to put them into context this is a recent phylogeny of the hymenoptera the insect order hymenoptera just to point out uh this is from bonnie blamer et al last uh, this year really nice phylogeny uh evolutionary tree of the different groups of hymenoptera and you can see obviously most of um most of the diversification of the insect order Hymenoptera, for all these different families of parasitoid wasps, wasps that lay their eggs in or on other insects, usually as hosts. Um, obviously at the bottom of the tree, the first, the first diverging groups of Hymenoptera were sort of plant feeding or sometimes fungus feeding sawflies and wood wasps. Then you got this massive diversification of parasitoid wasps and then and nested in the middle of them are the aculeates, which you know the stinging ants, bees, and wasps. Um, they just they just evolved uh, slightly different nesting behavior. But there, that tiny little branch there, uh, this very early early branching lineage going right back to um, well, going back a long way probably uh, are the ichneumonoid wasps. It's an I quite isolated lineage. Um, as I say, just these two families nowadays, Braconidae and Ichneumonidae, but they are massively successful. Many many species. Um, I can see the poll results coming in. Um, have you ever tried identifying Braconid wasps? Thankfully, I think two thirds of people have and one third haven't. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so for two thirds of you, hopefully uh, a lot of the sort of names that I'll be make, bringing up or some of the morphological terminology I'll be using will make sense. But, um, so that, but let's see how, I, but yeah, that, that's actually a pretty good result that two thirds of the people have, have tried identifying them. So again, what a, this is the UK fauna, which I will take as being representative of the entire world, which obviously isn't. But in the UK, uh, roughly half of our UK fauna of Hymenoptera are in fact the two, the sub, super family Ichneumonoidea. So these just these two families of 
parasitoid wasps um, amount to the, you know, all the rest of the hymenoptera put together, the sawflies, the uh, aculeates, and so, so on, and other parasitoid groups. So, so it is a big group. That's that's three, three and a half thousand species in the UK. Uh, of course, if you go to other parts of the world, there's many more. Although one of the advantages of being in the UK, in fact, up in these north temperate areas, is that there are loads of species of ignominoid wasps. They are not particularly species poor up here. And there, in the UK, again, in the British list at the moment, there's about 1,340 species of Braconids. So it's a great, if you want to get into Braconid wasps, uh, you've got lots to get your teeth into. Uh, they can keep you busy for your entire lifetime. Um, I think I gave a webinar previously on Ichumonids, which are my... Um, main interest but i will i will admit that uh braconids are pretty interesting too um let's go on so just again a quick recap and apologies if this is all really obvious um but just to put them into context what are ichneumonoid wasps well they're part of the apocrita that rather big group of hymenoptera in which uh which are parasitoids and things descended from parasitoids, in which they have a sort of wasp waist. And what that actually means, of course, is that what you see is the abdomen is actually the metasoma. And we call that metasoma because the first abdominal segment is fused to the uh, at the back end of the thorax. Uh, and that's the bit in grey there. And that means that the true, so the True abdomen is the propodium plus the metasoma. They've got a narrow constriction between the first and second abdominal segments, which makes the metasoma plus mesosoma. So that's a sort of characteristic of the apocrita. Which... And then how do you go about recognizing ichneumonoids amongst those? Well, there's, there's a few really useful recognition features. One of the most, most characteristic forms, one of the most characteristic features of ichneumonoid wasps is that the bottom, the underside of the, ab of the metasoma, You've got those bits labeled S, those are the sternites. You have the tergites on the, the top, you've got the sternites in the bottom, and the sternites in ichneumonoids are partially desclerotized, partly sort of uh, softer and often often kind of white in color, and they sort of shrivel up in death. Um, the, uh, the metasoma often sort of uh, shrivels inwards there. And this characteristic is this characteristic of the ichneumonoid wasps. So of course, there's all sorts of other uh, useful characters. Again, ichneumonoids have these this lovely wing vein feature, which is where the these two veins C and R are actually pressed up against each other. This drawing slightly exaggerates the gap between. There's no real gap between those two veins on the leading edge of the wing. They're sort of pressed up against each other, and that gets rid of the and that uh, so that sort of fuse fused vein, uh, getting rid of the costal cell is characteristic of ichneumonoids. Just to point out, if you're ever interested in features which are unique to Hymenoptera as a whole, there's these little hooks called the hamuli, which keep the wings together. Uh, ichneumonoids always have these, almost always have these long multi-segmented antennae, uh, usually more than 16 segments, although there's a little bit of variation, sometimes more than 70 in some of these uh, wasps that fly at night. But how do you recognize them? So there's two families which are, you know, quite similar in overall uh, shape, uh, but they've they've been diverging for you know a very long time. They do have some consistent differences between them. So usually you can recognize an ichneumonid or braconid pretty instantly on just their wing venation. As you can see, a lot of um, a lot of uh, braconids have that cross vein RS and M. Um, sorry, which may be called one out. SR plus M, depending on which wing vein naming system you're using. Uh, Ichneumonids almost always have that vein 2MCU. It's a big cross vein down, uh, which the Proconids, except for one species, lack. You'll notice there's always a slight exception. But the general shape of the wing venation is pretty distinctive for each. And again, when the hind wing veins are fully formed, there's a real difference in the hind wing um, in the which is kind of difficult to explain, but they do look very different here. Uh, and it's to do with where cross vein RSM is and uh, relative lengths of abscissae of CU. Anyway, this is all covered in various uh, various text uh, sort of identification guides, which we'll come on to at the end, which, which deal with the identification. There's 
you know, there's uh, quite some, some great literature for identifying Baconids and Ichneumonids and how to identify different subfamilies. But just to point out again, as I, I usually work in Ichneumonids, uh, that group with the slightly, uh, with the sort of rather characteristic big discus of marginal cell in the forewing, which looks a bit like a horse head. So Ichneumonids, a bit more species rich than Braconids, often a bit bigger than Braconids, uh, physically larger. Uh, unlike Ichneumonids, Braconids tend to have a lot more useful features in the wings. Uh, so the wing veins and the pattern of cells in the wings really differs a lot between different subfamilies of Braconidae. So you find that, well, I would say, going through, if you're trying to do the first step of identifying subfamilies of uh, Braconids versus Ichneumonids, I think you'll find the subfamily keys to Braconids a bit easier. And uh, there's some more than nice discrete differences in how many submarginal cells they have in the wing, whether there's a great big hole in the head, things like that. Um, so here's a few characteristic subfamilies from a handbook to British Braconid sub, uh, subfamilies. Uh, just to point out, of course, there's always complications. Um, one of the really common groups of Braconids is the subfamily Aphidiini. Uh, they attack aphids, they parasitize aphids, and most many of those have this a sort of disco submarginal cell which looks a bit like a, uh, a nicumonid, just to confuse. They actually have very reduced hind wing venation and they're small fragile things and in reality they're not often confused with ichneumonids but just on the forewing you could confuse them. And of course you get weird ichneumonids which are totally atypical which I've illustrated there. But on on the whole, you can uh, recognize one on wing venation. A nice feature, one of the special um, specializations that Braconids have, or most Braconids, is that the second and third metasomal segments, uh, the tergites on the top are actually fused. So you've got Nicomonid on the right there, and you can sort of count down the metasoma. You've got ooh, sorry, segments one, two, three, four. And there's a big distinct join between segments two and three. In Braconids, those segments are fused, and that's not the best picture. If you look at this one here, that's a better example. This is a Doric tine, Spathius. Um, this, what looks like one big segment here is actually the second and third metasomal tergites fused together. So you'll find two pairs of spiracles, those little breathing holes. You'll find the two pairs on that big segment. So that's a characteristic of Braconids. Uh, Ichneumonids almost always have those segments clearly separate. Uh, again, there's nice sources, uh, there's nice handbooks like the Shaw and Huddleston Guide, uh, which is in the Royal Entomological Society uh, Handbooks, the Identification of British Insects series. Uh, Case van Achterberg has a lovely big volume, which is again, is a both of these are free to download, uh, which is Case's key to subfamilies of Braconids, still really useful. Um, you will find when you go to different guides that they have slightly different names for all the wing veins, which is slightly frustrating. But um, you just, yeah, you'll get used to that. So yeah, so that's just a few quick notes really on how to recognize uh, a Braconid. But hopefully you'll recognize, as we sort of show some pictures, you'll recognize the overall body shape of Braconid wasps, which is often quite distinctive and often quite characteristic for different subfamilies. And a lot of this talk, I should, should have pointed out at the beginning, a lot of this talk will be about um, the biology of these things, what they're doing. And I'll try and also point a bit about, point out a little bit about what they look like and how you can go about identifying them. Um, but really, I think one of the best ways to think about um, the biology of Braconid wasps is to sort of put that into an evolutionary context, um, because they differ quite substantially in various um, ways, of, in various sort of ways they go about their lives. And some of that difference is down to the really quite different, probably ancestral biologies. They've, they've, they've diverged onto using different hosts and using those hosts in different ways. So again, cutting edge, some of the latest sort of studies of the evolution of Braconids have started to really settle on the on this overall sort of um, classification. I've simplified this a bit from a paper last year, but essentially Braconid wasps can be divided into some kind of strange archaic subfamilies like the Apozygini and the Trachypetini. Then there's big diversification of non-cyclostomes. The cyclostomes, which um, I'll come on to in a minute, which have 
a hole in their face, which is why they're called cyclostomes. And then you've got this complex of the aphid parasitoids and their relatives. So it's a really nice kind of si uh, system of putting all these different subfamilies, you know, 40 odd into um, a system of, uh, uh, into, into sort of informal complexes of subfamilies. I was hoping to find a better picture of this because we do have, uh, at some point, somebody took some nice pictures of our one specimen in, in the museum, but I couldn't find it. So there you go, there's a grotty picture of the type specimen of Apozix penyi. This is the most um uh this, this is the most ancient uh subfamily of Braconid wasps, represent um represented by one species found in Chile. Uh it has four wing vein 2 MCU, which the Ichneumonids have, um, which is quite of interesting and does suggest that maybe it was lost in the rest of the Braconids. But um yeah, I've actually been to Chile trying to find this uh wasp and totally failed. There are, there are a few specimens in collections. Um, it's a weird and wonderful little thing. Um, but again, yeah, probably a representative of really ancient lineage of Braconid wasps. One of the, there's a, another group we can um, get out of the way quickly is Trachypetiny. As with Apozix, we don't know anything about the biology of these things. Uh, the Trachypetines is a small sort of family, subfamily, only found in Australia. Just a few species. Uh, they're, they're really big for Braconids. Um, look superficially like nice Ichneumonids. Um, again, some of them very rare, uh, generally only represented by a few specimens in most collections. We'd love to know what these things are doing, how they're attacking hosts. Are they endoparasitoids? Do they lay their eggs inside the host? Do they lay them outside? It has some great implications for the evolution of biological strategies in the Braconids, but for the moment, nobody's ever reared them from any hosts, so we don't know what they do. Uh, there's another one, just uh, another tracky p time. Uh, beautiful things, but again, uh, kind of obs obscure. The next, the, the group, which is another really early diverging group, is often just called the non-cyclostomes, because it actually is there's a bunch of different subfamilies of uh, quite diverse appearance, uh, diverse biology, well, diverse host associations. Biologically, they're quite uniform. But, well, in some ways, we'll come on to that in a bit. But the non cyclostomes covers a lot of subfamilies that you'll encounter, which parasitize uh, caterpillars, beetles, um, adult insects, things like that. Uh, really huge group. The aphidioid complex is basically there's two main subfamilies one is the aphidiony the things that mummify aphids and are found all over the world but particularly species rich in the north temperate areas probably the other group is the mesostoiony um which is quite a uh, an interesting group which we're only really recently finding out about um the diversity of mesostoines they seem to be pretty diverse in southern south america and australia um and they don't occur up in Europe, so I'm going to um, ignore them from now on. But an interesting group which often attack gall-forming insects. And then the cyclostomes. This is the group which traditionally, which um, mostly have that hole. It's basically a sort of concave. Um, it's, it's a concavity between the mandibles and the clypeus, and the top of the clypeus. It looks like a sort of smooth um, hole in their, in their face. Some groups have developed really weird mandibles like these elysiines and they lack that cyclostome appearance, but they are they have evolved from cyclostomes. So it's a really diverse group of subfamilies, uh, do some really interesting things. And uh, Mark Shaw in particular did some, some nice early work looking at the biological evolution of some biological strategies in this group because they've um, you can see quite different developmental strategies within quite closely related insects, which is I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. So yeah, for those of you who aren't too familiar with parasitoid biology, it's really important, I think, at this point to uh, uh, go over some some big sort of uh, dichotomies between the ways that you know, the ways that these wasps uh, attack hosts or use other insects as hosts. So one of those is between ectoparasitoids and endoparasitoids. Uh, ecto, as the name suggests, ectoparasitoids lay their eggs on the outside of hosts, so their larvae live. On the outside and um basically suck the hemolymph from within the host and then sometimes consume it entirely 
endoparasitoids lay their eggs within the body of the host and um, their larvae are developing inside the host, but often in Braconids pop out at the end and have a final external feeding phase. The other variation, which again, if you're not uh, so used to parasitoids, are might be kind of weird terms here, idiobiosis and coenobiosis. So if a wasp practices idiobiosis, it's an idiobiont, or it could be a coenobiont. And the, um, the important thing here is that idiobionts paralyze the host. When they, they encounter the host, they sting it, lay an egg on it. Now, I say on it, they're usually ectoparasitoids, not always. Whereas coenobionts, if they sting the host uh, and introduce a venom, which they often do, then that is a short-acting venom and the host recovers afterwards and goes on to live a fairly normal life with the parasitoid larva in or on it. So, sorry, yeah, there. Host permanently paralyzed, host continues development. And that's kind of an important difference because it means that the wasps themselves can then exploit hosts in different niches. A coena biont can attack a host insect when it's more accessible, for example, and then continue its development once the host has formed a pupation retreat or something like that and then would be less accessible to other parasitoids or predators. Um, so yeah, let's just whiz through some subfamilies and tell you a bit about them. Aphidiines, lovely group. Um, so again, actually, if you're into aphidiines, uh, there is a, a lovely extensive literature on them. The hosts are pretty well known compared to most Braconid wasps um, because they attack a lot of economically important aphids. They're really good identification keys for quite large portions of the world, but they're not easy things to identify. Um, this is what they, they do. They mummify their hosts. So they, they develop inside as an endoparasitoid and towards the end of their larval development, they induce this these changes, this melanization of the host uh, aphid so that it forms a hardened uh, mummy which protects the, the wasp as it uh, pupates. Uh, so we've got on the left there, my left anyway, um, aphidius, which is the uh, big genus of aphidiines. And they typically um, pupate within the host mummy. And there's a prion on the right, which has formed, which is pupated underneath the, uh, the aphid cadaver. So there's interesting differences in their pupation technique. Um, and just to go on, so the cyclostomes, uh, which I mentioned before, there's that cyclostome mouth part again, that sort of uh, concave section. Um, this is characteristic of several subfamilies. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they have a cyclostome face, actually. If anybody has any great ideas as to what advantage this confers, it'd be really nice to know. What do they do? Um, some of the large subfamilies are ectoparasitoids, basically idiobiont ectoparasitoids. So these are things like Braconini and Dorictini. What they're doing is they're attacking concealed host insects, often um, larvae of beetles or moths, and they're paralyzing them, laying an egg on them and eating them as a as a bag of meat, essentially. Uh, then the endoparasitoids of Lepidoptera uh, are exemplified by one particularly lar quite large subfamily called the Rogodini. And these are things which lay their eggs inside caterpillars and then uh, delay their development until the host is a bit... Uh, usually nearly fully grown and then they mummify the host and then there's a big there's also a small subfamily uh, which, yeah there's a two large subfamilies called the elysiini and the opiini and i must apologize for my pronunciation by the way uh everyone pronounces things differently and um i'm told i often pronounce things very weirdly but uh hopefully you can see things written down and know know how what they're supposed to be um the Elysiines and the Opiines are parasitoids of, of Diptera and always Cyclographus Diptera. And they're a really diverse group, a really species rich group over a lot of the world, which have exploited uh, which have exploited uh, Diptera. And in, in some cases, uh, leaf mining Diptera. In, in other cases, you know, Diptera that are attacking, that are eating um, flesh of other insects and mammals and things like that. And they're all, they're coenobionts, endoparasitoids. Uh, they're the major diversification of Diptera parasitoids in the in the Braconidae. So here's a break on. If you go out, one of the 
groups that you find um, a lot just sort of casually collecting are the Brachanines. Um, and most of them, at least in, yeah, in many parts of the world, especially in Britain, most of the Brachani Brachanines that you find are this genus called Brachon. They're often quite attractively coloured, you know, um, uh, black and yellow, black and red, um, sometimes a dusky sort of infumate wings, quite long ovipositors a lot of the time. Uh, they're attacking a lot of uh, concealed coleoptera and lepidoptera hosts, sometimes diptera hosts. Uh, there's a caterpillar, there's a, um, a moth caterpillar, Hadena bicruris, the uh, lychnis, and there's the brachon larva sitting on it, uh, feeding on the paralyzed host. Uh, one genus of Brachanines, uh, Brachanines, C. Loides. These are quite often reared from tree trunks. They attack the bark beetles, uh, scolitids or scolitines. Uh, so I think most of these uh, galleries of of scolitis or whatever it is uh, have ended up being uh, got have ended up with a C. Loides um, cocoon in it. Where they've attacked a, a good proportion of that uh, of that bunch of bark beetles. Uh, rearing dead wood, you'll find loads of these things. Uh, another subfamily which relate uh, similar to Brachanines often attack uh, concealed hosts, the Doric tiny. These are mostly parasitoids of beetles, sometimes quite spectacular things going for deeply concealed beetles. Uh, I'll just put this in as Spathius polonicus because I photographed it fairly recently because this is a new, well, it's a species newly recorded in Britain. Um, which attacks these bupressed beetles, the genus Agrilus, and is one of these species that's being looked into as a potential biocontrol agent of the emerald ash borer, you know, that beetle that's causing so much havoc. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that this is uh, in Britain before we have the emerald ash borer, as far as we know. Um, anyway, the really nice um, Doric tines, often rather attractive things, quite big, uh, robust heads, often robust sculpturing on them. Um, and they've got a tough ovipositor. If you look at the ovipositors of Doric tines uh, close up, they've got a really dark, heavily melanized tip to the ovipositor because they're often going through quite hard substrates to, to reach their hosts. It's another one of those weird and wonderful cyclostomes. This is a thing called Hysteromerus, uh, Hysteromerus mysticinus. They're actually great big, almost globular heads. Uh, quite short antennae. Uh, and these things are not that uncommon, but you don't see them very often because they spend a lot of their time uh, burrowing through dead wood, trying to find beetle hosts. Um, so and Mark Shaw, again, um, a lot of this is Mark Shaw's photos because he's spent a lot of time rearing these things. Uh, Mark did a really nice paper on the biology of Hysteromerus. And unlike many of these parasitoids of deeply concealed beetles, what it does is actually so like I say, it chews through the wood and get, finds galleries of beetles and then basically directly contacts the host and jabs it with its ovipositor. Um, you can see a, a beetle pupa there with all these little white specks, which are the eggs of the Hysteromerus. Um, so it's gregarious. You've got a whole gregarious um, brood of Hysteromerus developing on the beetle. And again, very unusually for a parasitoid wasp, uh, at least for a braconid wasp, they exhibit parental care. So... The female, here you can see one uh, amongst uh, its brood of pretty much fully fed uh, larvae. So they've pretty much finished feeding on the beetle host. The female wasp is still with them, ensuring that she's uh, they keep safe. And as a result, Hysteromerus don't lay that many eggs in their life, life uh, in their lifetime. They'll only have um, uh, they'll only lay a few broods. But, uh, lovely little things. And that's the subfamily Rissolini. There's a little group called the Rysipolini. Um, this is Rysipolis decorator, which are fairly commonly found. Uh, sorry about the poor quality photos, I couldn't find much. Um, just to point out, again, if you're trying to identify these things, compared to some related cyclostone groups, Rysipolines have these two carini at the back of the head. You've got the occipital carina and then the uh, hypostomal carina, and they don't directly meet. They both go down to the base of the mandible, whereas in related groups of cyclostomes, the occipital carina bends and meets the hypostomal carina, if you're interested. They also have a, a spiracle sort of at the, the edge of the metasoma where the, the tergite um, bends over. But anyway, um, often reddish and black little things, 
They attack um, sort of semi weakly concealed uh, moths. Um, here's one that attacks a Gracilariid moth, Calyptilia robustella. So, Vicipolis decorator here, it's laid its egg um, on the sort of, um, it, I think it always lays it on the sort of membrane between two segments um, uh, on the back of its thorax. This is a moth which uh, lives on the folds of. Uh, of uh, maple leaves, I think, and it basically folds the uh, the lobe of the leaf over to make a sort of triangle and it lives in there. Um, the Rhysipolis is living on the outside of the host, but it lets it continue development. So it's a coenobiont, but it's an ectoparasitoid, which is kind of an unusual strategy in Braconids, but it's quite common in certain groups of Ichneumonid wasps. Uh, so there it is, and it's killing its host. And as you can see, it can in these uh, two cocoons on the right there, they can kill the host in an earlier instar. So, uh, but it, what it does is it pre precociously makes the host uh, pupate in an earlier instar than it normally would for former pre pupa That's another, that's one of those interesting characteristics of certain Braconid groups in which they make their hosts do different things. You know, they'll make the host pupate early or exhibit strange behaviors. Which, uh, we've got a couple of examples of those. Um, this is another sandstone group called the Rogodini. Uh, the most famous genus is Aliodes, but there's a little genus called Clinocentrus. Um, here's Clinocentrus cunctator, which is quite a reasonably common parasitoid of um, a common moth in the UK called the net nettle tap moth, so Anthophila fabriciana. And here's one searching for its host in, in some, um, some spun nettle leaves. And you can see these weird caterpillars here, they've been mummified by the wasp. So hardened, this sort of hardened, blackened, lozenge-shaped caterpillar, still with its head attached. And then within that mummy, the wasp pupates. And again, they can, um, you know, when they feel finished feeding, well, when the wasp larva is finished feeding, it uh, sort of makes the, it arrests the, it can kill the host of different uh, larval instars. So what it does, um, this is an example, a lovely dissection by Mark, showing that it, pen, it basically arrests the development uh, of the penultimate instar clinocentrus. And you can see, so it mummifies it at this point, but those spiky bits, that's pupal cuticle, which are already forming under the skin of the caterpillar. It, what it's done is it's accelerated the development of the caterpillar, which is very weird. They have a lot of, there's a lot of, um, strange chemical warfare going on with Braconid wasps. Uh, this is Aliodes, beautiful genus with loads of species all over the world, um, mummifying caterpillars. In Britain, there's quite a lot. I think I can't remember now, it's probably around 50 species, maybe. They're still being worked on by Mark and Case van Achterberg. But it, as opposed to, um, so the endoparasitoids, they lay their eggs in the hosts, but compared to a lot of other parasitoids, uh, a lot of other endoparasitoids, they're synovogenic, which is a bit different. It means they have quite a small number of eggs and they're quite big and yolky. Um, so then rather than laying loads and loads of eggs, which are much smaller, they're investing more in a smaller clutch of eggs. Um, they mummify their hosts. They're often quite long lived. You can keep these things in culture for months. Uh, there's loads of species. They're terribly difficult to identify. Um, there are some keys being published, but they they do, some of them attack a uh, particular host and then mummify them in particular ways. So you can often identify the species of Aliodes by the shape of the mummified caterpillar. Here's some weird and wonderful shapes here. Um, often quite easily found. Um, on the left there is one of our larger nocturnal species, Aliodes praetor, that, attack, that attacks um, hawk moth larvae and then, um, kills them when the, the hosts are still quite small. Because although it's a relatively big Braconid wasp, it's still pretty tiny compared to a big fully grown hawk moth, uh, sphingid larva. So it arrests the development of the host quite early. Yeah, it's a lovely, um, actually, uh, as I, I do run a recording scheme in the UK for nocturnal wasps. So if you do find Aliodes praetor at light, and they, especially in the south of England, they can be quite common. Uh, I'd really appreciate the records. That'd be great. It's an all orangey species, black antennae, black tips to the hind legs. 
uh, and relatively large. Uh, here's just a lovely mummy of a uh, Aliodes albitibia, which um, oh, it's a notodontid host, and I've forgotten what it is now. But what it does is it it sort of um, mummifies in half of the it uh, pupates in half of the mummy and leaves the other half apparently as a sort of air filled sac, so they can actually float in the water if, it, if the habitat gets flooded, which is rather cool. Like I said, um, if you're into Aliodes, and who wouldn't be, uh, there were these lovely series of papers being produced by uh, Case van Achterberg and Mark Shaw, and plus Donald Quick on the last one, really pulling apart. It's, it's the combination of many years of work, and it's very valuable as um, the taxonomy of these groups is of this genus is pretty tricky. Pretty tricky. There's a lot of old names floating around. There's a lot of very similar species, and uh, really, it's been an integrated approach of morphology, DNA, and biology to really tease apart what species there are in the Western Palearctic, and they're describing a ton of new species. Um, oh yeah, just to point out on this slide as well, uh, there's some little picture in the middle of a thing called Aliodes leptofema, which Case and Mark described in 2016, which is one of our most common Aliodes species. It just didn't have a name until 2016, which is one of those things you find fairly often in, in Braconid wasps or in Parastoid wasps generally. You know, there's been confusion over the identity of the species. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the one that's most, which I rear most frequently because it tends to mummify the hosts in quite con, uh, con, open, con, uh, conspicuous locations. So you find the mummy really easily. Oh yeah, so another cyclostone group, which are not physically cyclostone, they're just related to cyclostones. The Elysiines and Opiines, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, that weird and wonderful head is of is the head of Elysia mandicator, which is a really common species which attacks um, basically uh, maggots in corpses uh, in particular. So you, you see there's amazing mandibles. They're like big, they're really uh, large. They have sort of three main teeth. Some genera have extra little teeth in there. And they're used for sort of prizing apart uh, puparia of their hosts. Very specialised for emerging from Cyclorhaphus diptera puparia. Uh, really cool group. They're all coena biomes. They're all endoparasitoids, as far as we know. Always emerging from the puparium. It's a bit of a nightmare. There are, you know, some keys which cover a lot of the genera. There's no the opines. Luckily, uh, Case van Achtberg uh, published a key this year. To the opine genera of Europe, which was something we were sorely lacking. Uh, so that should hopefully open them up a bit more. There's loads of species. A lot of the species level keys are pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, but there are some modern revisions. Yeah, nice, a nice group, uh, especially, you know, people, they're a nice group as in they're species rich all over the world and can probably tell you a lot about habitat. Uh, richness but you know a lot of species still to be described here's an incomprehensible phylogenetic tree um this is the non-cyclostones this group of like six in britain and ireland you know 16 subfamilies so this is the sort of one of the major this is the sort of uh the larger part of the braconids um just to point out there's quite a lot of different subfamilies around the world and they're arranged into different complexes at the moment um, but they're all, as far as we know, coena biont endoparasitoids. So they're all laying their eggs inside hosts and then um, letting the host develop further. There's been quite a lot of research interest into various groups for, you know, for the usual reasons, such as biological control of pest insects. But there's really interesting, uh, there's a lot of interest in their viruses. They have, they harbour uh, Bracoviruses, which are sort of poly DNA or polydna virus. Uh, these viruses help um, overcome the host immune system. Uh, very cool things. They're completely uh, dependent on the wasps. They're integrated into the wasp genome. Uh, so this is just a, a relatively, this is a sort of representative non-cyclostone braconid wasp. It's a microgastrin. It's, it's this microgaster nixolebian. And what it's doing here is it's finished feeding in the host, which is Anthophila fabriciana again. Um, and you can see it popping out. 
uh, emerging from the host and then starting to feed on the external feed externally on the host and then spin its cocoon. Um, most of these braconids are attacking Lepidoptera, Coleoptera. Like I said, some have Bacoviruses. There's a really lovely exception. So many, many of these are attacking larval hosts, obviously, um, which is the standard sort of parasitoid life history. But one subfamily is specialised on adult insects, and that's the Euphorini. Really fascinating, um, di diverse uh, subfamily there, attacking a variety of, uh, of whole, a variety of adult insects. Uh, this is one of the subfamilies, yeah, two of the subfamilies which um, used to be considered one, they used to be the Helconini, they've now been split, so it's the Brachistini and the Helconini, but these parasitoids are beetle larvae for the most part. Um, some are quite big and spectacular, that Helcon, Helcon angustator is a beautiful um, large braconid which attacks um, wood-boring beetles, that's a species that's just turned up in the UK in the last few years. And is now apparently quite common. Um, then you've got blackest species, which can be really quite numerous, um, attacking little plant feeding, usually plant feeding beetle larvae. Um, one of the things you'll find here is that, as far as we know, none of this group attack uh, predatory beetle larvae. Uh, I'd love someone to prove me wrong. But... And just put a picture blackus, um, are usually quite small and kind of difficult to identify. Oh. Although there is a nice, you know, thorough key by Case Van Atteberg. But sometimes you get surprises like this kind of reddish uh, species on the right there with quite pale antennae, black tips. And um, couldn't, uh, a colleague showed me that the other day and I have no idea what it is. Um, Case Van Atteberg thinks it might be undescribed. So that's, that's weird. That just turned up in Southern England. So there's, again, there's always nice things to be found with these obscure groups of braconids. Um, this is a group called the Meteorini. So again, it, actually, if you look at different uh, authors, we'll treat this differently. Um, Mark and I have been um, regarding meteorines as their own little subfamily. They, they attack larvae of Lepidoptera, or in some cases, beetles. So they attack the larvae. Um, sometimes they spin this lovely cocoon at the end of a thread, dangles like a meteor, hence meteorus. Uh, they can be quite common, uh, including at light. Um, there's two genera, Zele and Meteorus. But many um, other authors will treat this as a, a, a tribe of um, the subfamily Euphorini, which otherwise attack adult insects. Um, there's a lovely revision for the entire Western Palearctic um, Meteorus and Zele. So very handy. One of those few groups where there's where all the keys, uh, where the keys are in one handy place to all the species. Uh, most meet meteorines have this kind of fairly uh, simple wing venation. They've got all the cells there. They've got this uh, second submarginal cell is quite rectangular or square. Um, big eyes, because they're often uh, flying at night, sometimes very colorful eyes, uh, and often sort of petiolate um, metasoma, as in the first metasomal segment is and anteriorly quite narrow. It's very flexible where it joins to the uh, mesosoma. Um, and then they fly, uh, many of them, like I said, fly at night. So again, I'm kind of interested in records of these things in Britain anyway. Uh, lovely. So like I say, they are probably nested within the Euphorini, this large subfamily. Uh, Euphorines come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, adapted to attacking very different host insects. Um, you've got Microctonus brassicae on the left, which um, uh, attacks uh, cabbage flea beetles. You've got Cosmophorus in the middle with its great big jaws and a great big gap for holding on to these scolited beetles um, that holds onto the beetle so it can't move and then lays an egg in it. Uh, this is a ladybird, seven spot ladybird, which has the which is standing over the cocoon of a wasp, Dianocampus coccinelli, which has eaten its insides, well, eaten its hemolymph inside. So, uh, like I said, very unusual in attacking adult insects, and they attack lace wings, they attack um, uh, beetles, obviously, a lot of the time. There's some, t I think there's so much attack, um, well, there are some which attack true bugs, so it's a very rare instance of. Um, 
an ichneumonoid group which attack and insects which aren't Helmetabolus. Uh, this is a Christmas card which Mark received from a, a colleague in Germany. Very lovely, just what you want. Uh, apologies if you've seen this before, but here's a euphorine ovipositing into the antennal, into where the antenna connects with the head of the beetle uh, laying its egg in there. They're very, um, so if these, particularly the euphorines which are attacking adult beetles have to be quite uh, inventive in how they get the egg in how they get the egg into the host beyond you know this hard cuticle so sometimes they go through the mouth parts sometimes through the uh, antennal socket and a few species are known to insert the egg uh, the ovipositor into the anus of the host uh, so getting soft tissue wherever they can find it uh slightly different subfamily are the chelonines the chelonine are great they're named after tortoises here's the the metasoma the abdomen there are a couple of closely related species. You can see they're often, um, they're almost always this sort of oval shape, hard, all the tergites are fused together. So it's like a carapace. And they often have these pale spots. They're terribly difficult to identify the species. Um, two of the genera, Thanoatoma and Ascogaster, have decent keys and for the Western Paleoctic, at least. The big genus Chelonus, which is species rich in much of the world, is, is a real taxonomic nightmare. Uh, I don't know how to identify them. Um, unlike a lot of other Braconids, they're laying their eggs into the egg of the host. Um, and then they have a, a long, um, they have basically sit there for a long time until the host is a pre pupa, at which point it gets killed by the parasitoid. And again, they can control the development of their host, um, making it uh, bringing along the sort of uh, rushing along the pre pupil uh, instar. Another great group of Braconids, the Macrocentrines. These have, again, very simple wing venations, sort of ans like got all the wing veins, got all the cells. They look like a classic Braconid. Um, they're often quite large, long ovipositors. Uh, people find Macrocentrines quite frequently, especially as they're at light, they come to light quite often. And there's one really common nocturnal species in Britain called Macrocentrus bicolor. There's plenty of the different species. They're either they go they use these long ovipositors to attack um concealed hosts usually uh, always lepidoptera um there's another group called charmon subfamily charmon tiny which look quite similar but they they lack the second they they um yeah they they lack that second submarginal cell in the forewing but here they go um you can see a whole brood of them which have just been eating a caterpillar host uh, and they burst out to spin their cocoons. Uh, well, to have their final ectophagus feeding phase before they spin their cocoons. Uh, and really neat feature of some of these macrocentrous species is that they're polyembryonic. So they lay one egg, which then divides and divides into many um, clones, sort of a bunch of, sister, bunch of sisters, which all are well, usually sisters, which eat the host. Uh, this, is, this is known in calcidoids in the family Encertidae as well. Really neat trick. As Sigalfines are a group which, sort of like the chelonines, so if we go back, that chelonine metasoma, there's a couple of other groups of Braconids which have a similar metasoma, but it often has a sort of uh, articulation between the first and second segments. And one of those groups is the Sigalfini, you know, Sigalfini. We only have one species in Britain called Acampsis alternopes, but the genus Sigalfus is found in Southern Europe. It's a cool little um, cool little wasp. It flies early in the spring, attacking the early spring uh, caterpillars of its geometrid host. And as you can see here, uh, you've got the adult wasp laying its egg into that really tiny little caterpillar. It looks very unfair. It's very um, uneven uh, competition here. But they're not only laying their egg into the tiny host, they're laying it into the, very specifically into one of the ganglia of the, you know, one of the sort of um, into the brain of the host and the egg of the acampsis will sort of do, sit there for a while. The larva will sit in this host ganglion for a while before emerging. It sort of then moves around the host of these sort of uh, pseudopods, these sort of fleshy little protuberances, eventually eats 
uh, much of the inside of the host and here it is bursting out again, emerging to have its final external feeding phase. And this big group, uh, one of the biggest groups, uh, and I know we've got Jose listening in today, who's like, who knows vastly more about microgastro and wasps than I do. So I'll try not to, um, I'll try not to uh, fluff this too much. Microgastrines are basically sort of the largest, probably the largest subfamily of braconids. There's an awful lot of species. To really characteristic biology and often really nice differences between closely related species in terms of the hosts they use. To me, they always look, they look pretty uniform morphologically. They, they're kind of, they do differ a bit. Some have long off repositors, some have short. Um, they're basically kind of quite stumpy things with large back legs. Um, quite simplified wing venation. They miss, they're missing the sort of cross vein, the um, radial vein RS at the end of the wing. Again, they have polydenoviruses, these brachoviruses, which they inject into the host, which they sort of, the virus is integrated into the wasp genome and then gets um, uh, expressed and then gets injected into the host. Uh, compared to the old, older one, there are keys to most of the British species, quite old keys by Gilbert Nixon, which are actually very good. But since Gilbert Nixon's time, you know, late 60s, early 70s, the genera have been completely overhauled. We've got load, quite a lot more genera now than we recognised then, when most of these microgastrines were lumped into the genus of Pantales. Um, there's now a lot more. Uh, they do really interesting things, and Mark really loves them, so they've got got quite a few of his nice photos or photos he's accrued. Um, one of the essential things, so if we, you remember that, uh, if I dash, sorry, I'm just gonna dash back through a few slides just to point out, um, let's see. Yeah, so that, this microgastrine here, microgaster is sort of a, a classic braconid feeding technique. You know, they, they eat the hemolymph of the host, uh, the blood of the host, essentially, and it's uh, fat, some fatty tissue. But then they emerge and, and feed on the rest of the host, quite con you know, like a predator at the end. Um, that is still characteristic of some of the microgastrines, but a lot of microgastrines and the euphorines, I should point out, you know, these euphorines, which are attacking adult insects, um, you know, they are... Together with the microgastrines, these things are actually mostly feeding on the heme lymph of the host. They're not actually eating its vital organs or anything like that. They're feeding on the heme lymph. Um, and so they then emerge, leaving a host which is, um, you know, generally kind of recognizable and still has most of its bits, but it's not going to live um, that much longer. So they, here's um, butterfly larva. This is the white admiral. Um, it's a Catesia sibilarum. They've got a whole brood. They're often gregarious, I should point out, but some species are um, some species are gregarious. Some are uh, solitary, and some can do either strategy, depending on the size of the host or the generation. But here they are emerging from the host and very quickly spinning their silken cocoons, and in this case, still attached to the host caterpillar, which is still alive. Um, yeah, here's a lovely geometrid caterpillar, still going about its business, but it's got all these uh, wasp cocoons now attached to it, and it won't last that much longer. But clearly, if you're, um, this is Catesia glomerata, uh, very common species, at least in Europe. Um, it's also been introduced to other parts of the world, but it's, it's a really common species which attacks pieris, white butterflies, and can often be found in the garden attacking um, Pieris glomerata, you know, Pieris um, prasiki. Here, the, here's a brood coming out of their host. You may have seen this before if you've seen one of my talks. I just love this little bit of video that we shot at the museum. But um, they come out and they're really rapidly spinning their cocoons. And then they, they have these lovely sort of yellow cocoons, which the caterpillar then sits over and protects. Um, so again, this, this is a lovely example of how these wasps can manipulate the behavior of their host. So that the caterpillar will, in fact, if you try and disturb it, it will um, thrash around. Uh, if you try and, so they'll thrash around and they'll even lay down more silk over the, uh, the wasp cocoons to further protect them. So here's some other examples, of this sort of behavior. 
taking advantage of their host. Sometimes they're just taking advantage of the host uh, color pattern. So here's um, a microplitus species, which has been attacking, um, oh, what are these noctuid caterpillars? It's completely gone out of my head what they are. Uh, but basically they're taking advantage of the fact that the, the host is pretty distasteful. It's, it's advertising its aposematism. Uh, hopefully birds won't want to eat that. Uh, there's another one there. Sometimes they are, uh, again, like I said, take advantage of the fact the host is still alive for a while. And they often, in fact, when the, um, oh, sorry, that's a different one. But when the um, larvae are emerging from the host, they have their final ecdysis, they have their final molt. And as they're coming out of the body of the caterpillar, their last larval instar uh, cuticle then sort of partially plugs the hole they're leaving behind. So it's, it's thought, at least in some cases, that's probably prolonging the life of the caterpillar so that it ca can actively protect them. Um, this is a cocoon mass. Sometimes you see these things on twigs, and this is Dialcogaster alvearia, and this characteristic shape is from where the caterpillar was looped over it until the caterpillar died and fell off. And you can see these things attached to twigs. Uh, this is a cocoon of a Cartesia, a solitary Cartesia, which attacks the brimstone butterfly. Uh, this is an overwintering cocoon. It's spun quite tough silk. Um, it's sort of disguised as a bit of a thorn or something. Hopefully it will survive the winter in there. These are, uh, again, different sort of weird and wonderful cocoons, microgastrines. Uh, the, the Folitesor, Folitesor lautella there, that's attacking, um, I think it's attacking a Gracilariad again. And what it's done is it's spun its cocoon by these delicate spin silk threads. So it's suspended within the, the uh, tent made by the caterpillar. It's uh, presumably then much more difficult for ants and things to actually uh, attack it. Here's Cartesia venesi, um, a butterfly. They've, they're spinning massive silk. What this and a few other species do is spin just really excessive amounts of silk, and then they'll pupate, they'll form their cocoons within the, the middle of this uh, silk mass. And that, um, yeah, that sort of cotton wool mass is, again, a protection against predators. So yeah, here's a few sort of the, just quickly some adaptations of these endoparasitoid wasps to their peculiar lifestyles. Like I said earlier, they they have viruses which they've, they've co-opted. Uh, they've got this rather, Poor photo here, but this really nicely illustrates the ovaries of an endoparasitoid queen of biont wasp, absolutely packed full of eggs. They lay a lot of eggs. They're pro ovigenic, they're ready to go, they don't need maturing. Sometimes they are alethical egg, alethical egg, I don't even know how you pronounce it, but they'll lay an egg which has this um, membrane around it which absorbs nutrients from the host, and then the Parasitoid wasp larva will eat the cero the serosal cells from the which um uh, and this sort of trophamnion around it. So they're actually absorbing, they're protected from the host whilst um, absorbing nutrients from it into these special cells, which the host, uh, which the wasp larva then eats before it emerges properly and starts eating the host. Really cool. Sometimes they have these very specialized larvae. Um, I think this is um, a euphorine. It's got big head capsules with big mandibles for killing other parasitoid wasps that they find inside the body of the host. They look like alien things. Obviously, in later instars, these pseudopods disappear and the host and the head becomes much more simple and become rather more maggot like. Uh, if you're rearing parasitoid wasps like those microgastrines, you can often see when the, the wasp emerges, it cuts a really neat little cap. Um, not so, on the right there, that's a microgastrine that's been attacked by a hyperparasitoid wasp, an ichneumonid, and you can see it's a much more ragged emergence hole. Um, so you can, if you're rearing broods of these things, you can actually tell which ones have been hyperparasitized. So another parasitoid attacking the parasitoid. Just want to put a quick plea in. There's actually a lovely little um, handbook, again, by Mark Shaw, and there's a recent paper that he's published um, in the British Journal of Entomology and Natural History. Let me know if you want it and I can send it. But, you know, it's really important when you're rearing these wasps to record the data properly and to record uh, the host and to keep the host remains with the specimens. Um, so I won't go into all the ins and outs of data and stuff, but just to point out, you know, if you've got a big gregarious uh, brood of, of wasps, you don't need to pin everyone up, but 
pin a few, put the rest in gelatin capsules. Gel gelatin capsules are great. Um, and then clearly label that it's one of a brood of whatever. And do keep the cocoon masses and the host remains if you have them. Host remains are incredibly important because you're, you may have misidentified the host. Somebody else may have misidentified something. If you can go back to it, that's, that's great. And the cocoons of wasps are often really important identification features as well. If you want to get more into Braconid wasps, and who wouldn't, um, there's some nice introductory texts out there. Here's a uh, selection which are particularly relevant to the to uh, well, actually, no, they're not particularly relevant to you. Uh, two of these. We've got the classification and biology of Braconid wasps. That's available as a PDF from the Royal Entomological Society website. Yeah, it's a lovely book by Mark Shaw and Tom Huddleston. Um, 1991, so it's a bit out of date in some areas, but it's still great. Case for an act of birds key, which again is available online for free. Uh, illustrated key to the subfamilies of Braconidae, still very useful, even though it's a, again it's a bit old. Um, uh, there are PDFs going around this manual of new world genera of the family Braconidae. It's a great book, really nicely illustrated keys to the genera of all the subfamilies. And a lot of these subfamilies are found, obviously, not just in a lot of these genera are found in Europe as well. So it's really useful keys. And of course, Donald Quick's book, The Braconids and Ichneumonid uh, Parasitoid Wasps, which is a sort of overview, uh, quite a lot, lots of information about ichneumonid wasps as a whole. It's very nice. 2000. That's a lot more recent. I've forgotten when it was published. But check those out. If you're using older literature to look, to look at um, Braconid wasps in, in Europe, in particular, you'll note there's been quite a few splits in recent, quite a bit of change in recent years. So the old concept of the Rogodiony, this big cyclostone group, has now been split up. So there's several, there's, well, at least in in uh, Northern Europe, there's now five subfamilies in what used to be considered one. Um, little things like that weird Hysteromerus that I showed you earlier, which looks after its larvae. That's now, used to be in its own little subfamily. It's now recognised as just a strange little grisoline. The little genus, which I haven't mentioned until now, Namptodon, which are really unusual in that they attack they attack leaf mining um, Lepidoptera of the family Nepticulidae, so Stigmella. Um, I think they're the only ichneumonoid group which attack Nepticulids. Anyway, they're now in a little group called Telengiani. Proteropiony being split from Ichneutiony. These are um, sawfly parasitoids within the Proconids. So yeah, just be aware of those little changes. Um, I have a I have a, a very rough and ready key which um, Again, Mark and I modified a few years ago to try from that original key in Shaw and Huddleston. We've tried to take account of changes in the UK fauna since then and changes in the classification. So I've really got to update this. It's, you know, I took some rough and ready photos, which I haven't replaced with nice ones yet. But there is, again, if you're working on the UK fauna, uh, yeah, I can give you this key, which is um, a, a more convenient, hopefully a sort of simplified key to the subfamilies that you only find in the UK. Um, Braconids, um, like many other groups, they're great indicators of change in the environment. Um, there are lots of changes. Just the obvious disadvantage is that you, you don't know enough about the fauna in the first place to know what's changing, but we can certainly see things happening. Um, again, you may have seen some of these examples before, but on the bottom left there, this Orionis coxator, this is a Braconid which looks a bit like Meteorus, except it lacks the second submarginal cell. It's got a... This thing was described in the Russian Far East uh, about 30 years ago. Now it's just started turning up in Europe. Um, in Britain, they first turned up in my, well, they were first collected in my garden. Um, I'm sure they're all over the place by now. But again, how, how they got here, nobody knows, but they're clearly spreading rapidly throughout uh, Northern Europe. Hel as I think I mentioned earlier, Helcon Angustator, it's part of a, well, there's a project I've got going with forest research at the moment. We're, we're starting to look at change in parasitoids. Some of the parasitoid wasps associated with dead wood beetles. Uh, that fauna has changed a lot in the last few years. There's been a whole bunch of new things have arrived in, in Britain. So that's been really fascinating to see. And there's Spathius again, this new, um, again, seems to be a new arrival, which is um, attacking Agrillus species, particularly associated with hawthorn. So yeah, if you're into recording these things, again, in Britain, iRecord is sort of the default for many of uh, these recorders. I think iNaturalist as well, of course. Uh, this These sorts of data are now 
becoming increasingly useful for looking at um, getting data on some of these groups, particularly nocturnal wasps in my case. But, you know, you've got a little map of Dinocampus coccinelli there from the National Biodiversity Network showing their their data on this species. It's actually probably, they just goes, you know, nobody is recording these things really. And sadly, not many of us are in a position to verify the records either. But if we can, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get a bit more recording effort in the next, uh, you know, we'll just increase the momentum and get more records so we can get truer ideas of the distribution of these species. Dinocampus coccinelli, which attacks adult ladybirds, is probably everywhere in the UK. So those little dots uh, just to show how unrecorded it is, not its actual distribution. But yeah, I'm really interested in, like I said earlier, in getting data, particularly in nocturnal groups. And yeah, thank you for thank you for listening, and thank you very much to Mark, my my uh, co-conspirator, and all the photographers who gave their lovely images. Uh, any questions right now? Thank you very much indeed, Gavin. Um, that was a, that was a fascinating introduction, and just uh, yeah, just demonstrates just an incredible range of strategies. And um, you know, it's and it's and it's much more interesting than talks on identification. It's, it's just it's much more interesting to know about the behaviours and <clears throat> and there's so much more to learn. Clearly, yeah, yeah, Sorry. always more to learn. Um, so yeah. I, I must admit, I, I started, so just a bit of context, I started trying yeah. to identify parasitoid wasps when I was going to Liverpool Museum quite frequently as an undergraduate and uh, fantastic, you know, fantastic, the entomologists at Liverpool were amazing in helping me. But also it's because nobody really knew about these things that I ended up going down that um, kind of rabbit hole and have uh, never emerged yet because it yeah, takes up your entire life. Great. Well, and, and thank you to, to you and Mark also for, you know, the in-person workshop you gave at Liverpool Museum in, back in February. So, I well, know uh, oh it's great. It's great to see uh, people actually interested in wasps. Uh, as, well, yeah, everybody should be. Did anybody have any questions? Yeah, good Hello. questions. <laughs> Hello, uh, yes, please ask away. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask something that might be a bit out of your knowledge, but um, it's the first time for me to hear about the BRACON viruses. Um, and I wanted just to ask, like, if you know if those are used as, uh, like, if they are used as like uh, by control agents or if, if other like uh, parasitoids have viruses or like if you know something else about this because it's really it, it's really like weird and if you if you can like separate them from the from their hosts you know yeah it's um i don't know enough about um uh, these poly dna viruses polydna viruses uh must admit um i mean, probably should should start uh, learning more about them, but it's a so this um there's different so brachyoviruses are sort of thought to be one uh, derived from one sort of acquisition of the an ancestral virus by uh, braconid wasps and they've diversified a lot. Um, they they occur in several subfamilies. Then there's an independent sort of acquisition of pedlidna viruses in the family Ichneumonidae, or maybe even two two independent um, acquisitions of these viruses. So it's clearly happened at least twice maybe more times that these that wasps have ended up picking up these viruses and assimilating them into their genomes and then uh it's, it's enabled them to really sort of diversify particularly onto different groups of lepidoptera as hosts really uh take advantage of the really overcome the immune system of these uh caterpillars um if any but yes um yeah there's also gets slightly the, we don't actually know exactly which groups have them yet either. So there's a lot of screening at the moment going on with um, genomes that are being produced to look for the signatures of these poly DNA viruses within the genomes of different wasps. Um, yeah, they're a really cool group. It's a really, yeah, it's fa fantastic. They, the viruses themselves have not been used in sort of biological control, but the, the wasps that use them have been extensively used. Um, and there's a lot of interest 
in how host specific the wasps are obviously and to whether they might have non-target effects you know if they're uh, we want them to be destroying the we want them to be attacking the hosts they're design, they're sort of being released to attack we don't want them to be attacking native hosts which are not pests thank Thanks, you <laughs> there was a perhaps a related question or perhaps you've already covered it really um in the chat which was please do you have any information on viruses in agath agath <laughs> thank you uh no i don't that's a very good question i I'm struggling to, I don't think agathodines have viruses, but maybe they do. Jose, do you know? As far as we know, they don't, but they could. And um, so more lineages have been discovered in the past year that parasitize um, caterpillars that have uh, viruses. And this is open, it's an open question right now. So the answer will be right now is not, but we don't know. And by the way, great talk, Gavin. I love it. Thank you so much. No, oh, thanks for coming. Um, so there's a yeah, there's a so the next question in there was from Sonia Allen, who asked, I assume we have been looking at females ovipositing, but what do males look like? Are they the same but without the ovipositor? Can the wasp laying eggs choose the sex of the grub which emerges? Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um Often, so in Braconids, I think the males often, males and females are often fairly similar looking. They, they can be quite different colour patterns, um, but yes, they obviously lack the ovipositor. Um, males tend to be a bit more difficult to identify because they don't have these sort of nice features which are adaptations towards attacking hosts. So I think they're, they're lacking some of those sort of species-specific characters. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely they can choose the sex of the uh of their offspring so when a wasp is laying an egg it's actively choosing whether to fertilize the egg or not um so that is because the fertilized eggs produce females and the unfertilized eggs produce males uh so it's a very neat trick where especially if they're so they can use that's the most obvious uh probably in these gregarious species you know if they're laying a brood of eggs into a host caterpillar uh they'll often just lay you know like a couple of male eggs and a bunch of females because uh, you only need the females to be uh you only need the males to make sure that the fee that the resulting females are fertilized and can go off somewhere you don't want to produce too many males because that's a waste of resources um yeah males are not good for much in hymenoptera when you <laughs> when you were saying that um normally when the, the strategy where one egg is is laid but then they can they create a lot of sisters do they do do something different if if that particular species or species group is is getting males would they lay a few eggs and they would just be males or uh sorry uh i suppose if the uh, uh so often they'll choose to well so sometimes there's different sort of well there's obviously every sort of exception you can think of but Often male eggs are reserved for um, poorer quality hosts. So if they've got a choice between, you know, a bigger host and a smaller host, then again, you would sort of just lay a male egg on the smaller host, which isn't going to have as much resource because you want to female, you want to use the resources, the resources effectively. So, um, but also if a wasp isn't, if the ovipositing wasp hasn't actually mated herself, if she's not fertilized, then she can still go and produce males and have, you know, she still has a chance of passing on her DNA that way. Okay, yeah, that's next stuff. Okay, the qu there's a question from Maria Rodi. Um, Do you know about any projects going on that are open to apply regarding Reconnets? Um, well, as in research projects or... Yeah, someone's, yeah, someone's um, actually responded here to say a PhD position is open at the University of Bristol. Oh, brilliant. About social wasps across Africa. So that's not quite not quite the same. same but um it depends where you are. And so I think yeah, I must admit, I don't quite know what's going on in most places at the moment. Um but you know, always look out there are PhDs that come up or you know, postdocs, whatever, in, in this area. I just think particularly within Britain, it's kind of we're in a slightly sad situation at the moment in which I 
there's almost nobody in like university positions who actually works on parasitoid wasps there's just a couple of people um certainly nobody working on like humanoid wasps really um so there isn't the supervisors for these yeah, yeah. Studies, really. i mean i i co-supervise some projects and get them going but again you know i'm not based on university i need university collaborators um which is cool but look out for you know there are there's a lot more research going on in some areas uh you know particularly applied uh in the applied entomology field and also behavioral ecology of course you know there's a great tradition of behavioral ecology work using parasitoid wasps um a lot of cool stuff going on in uh, the netherlands and places like that Cool. Okay. Uh, a question from Naveli Cazares. I'm, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Um, do you make a process to preserve cocoons of gregarious reconid wasps? Um, no, I mean, you don't need to do anything much. I mean, they're lovely, tough things. You just need to, I just put them in as big a gelatin, you know, if it's a big cocoon mass, I try and find a gelatin capsule that's big enough. Um, that's best option you could you know you, you see some of the tougher cocoons uh glued onto cards and things like that i always think it's it's not quite as good to actually glue things on uh because you know obviously it can come loose at some point and um which is why the capsules are great because it's containing it and hopefully um it's not going to roll around and get disassociated but you don't need to do anything much to preserve them that you know that as long as you're keeping them away from pests and out the light they'll they'll do really well right okay a, a question from ranjith um which family according to you shows the most fascinating behavior and why um i suppose i'm not allowed to say icky monid so um, I... <laughs> which i so, okay, guess subfamily then yeah yeah um personally i think um what do i like i mean i just euphorines i think they're great the way they attack their mm. you know adult hosts and um i've you know especially i've seen some lovely pictures of this oh, i always forget which one it is it's probably it might even be cosmophorus you know which i showed you the massive mandibles it's physically lifting this beetle up and then just shoving uh, and then laying an egg into it whilst it's sort of you know struggling in the air um uh, yeah i think that's pretty cool right right okay a question from andy is there a recommended key to the genus Alicia? Am I saying that? Alice? Yeah, there is. Um, I mean, I always use uh, Bob Wharton uh, did a, a key to most of the sort of uh, to sort of northern hemisphere species in two volumes. Um, yeah, again, if if actually if anybody particularly wants access to that key or or anything else they can't find, you know, just email me. I'll see. But uh, yeah, Bob's keys to uh, Alicia. Uh, are very nice um they they are also included in some old older sort of german keys by uh fisher which i, I won't recommend quite as uh yeah i, I don't quite recommend them quite as enthusiastically but but yeah there are some keys okay thanks gavin um oh, oh one more that's coming now um from hazami um, thank you very much. In some cases, we must send the specimens abroad ab of the country to the specialists for identification. Which is the best way to package and post and send the samples abroad? So it depends. Uh, well, I, I when I receive things, it's usually um, in the be the best way to, to make sure they sort of don't get smashed up on route. Um, you know, obviously. If you can send it in in alcohol, uh, then do so. That's pretty neat. But I know there's often restrictions on that. Um, just in a tube with a little bit of sort of um, tissue paper in there. Uh, so you've sort of basically put have the specimen in the tube, put tissue paper in so it doesn't have much, so the specimen doesn't have much space to ru rattle around. Um, and make sure that that isn't compacted, you know, so it's not like, um, sometimes you see this like hard plug of compacted tissue paper which then actually becomes like a bullet and smashes your wasp up you you want a bit of loose tissue paper in there just to keep the thing safe and as long as it's dry and it can't you know rattle around too much it'd be absolutely fine okay thanks Kevin. okay uh right and we have a question from 
Jitty Gruthius. I'm sorry, such a global audience tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I am struggling. Um, okay, in one of your slides, you mentioned a certain genus to be endoparasitoids, and it seemed that this was implied by the extin puparia. But was that the only clue? Because I know of chalcids that are ectos on fly pupae that are inside the puparium. Yeah, you know, no, it's a great point. Um, I think so. Hopefully, in most of the cases I will have mentioned, you know, there's been quite detailed studies and on the biology of these things and uh, how they are indeed developing within the host. But in some cases, we don't know the details. And I think I think I mentioned Namptodon briefly. As far as I'm aware, I mean, Namptodon is one of these things where we think they're attacking their endoparasitoids within these little leaf mining moths, but they may not be. It's just based on supposition, and you're quite right about the. Uh, there are definitely some examples within. I'm struggling to think of preconid examples, but I could think of ichneumonid examples where we think they're basically, they are probably basically ectoparasitoids on pupae, um, but within within a pupa, they're basically li living within a sort of ectodysal space underneath the the pupal shell. So that that kind of strategy does exist. Yeah, and it is quite difficult to differentiate that. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, uh, a question from Azru Azar. Can we predict the host of Braconids without rearing it? In in case I got samples from sweep net or fogging. You can always make a, a generalization that some groups, you know, wherever we know the hosts, we know so like elysiines, we always we know that every elysiine that's been reliably reared is a parasitoid of Diptera. And we also know there's differences between the tribes. So the whole tribe Dachnozini, for example, are all attacking uh Phytophagus Diptera. So you can sort of make presumptions like that, but you know, in, in other cases, you know, no way. So like Brachanines, for example, which, you know, you you never know what they might be attacking. They they attack a huge variety of hosts. Um, and indeed, you know, some of them have been shown to be phytophagous recently. You know, you never know. But Iphidiines, I noticed somebody's put in Iphidiines there. Yeah, you know that they, as far as we're, Iphidiines are all going for aphids. So you can make some generalizations, but, you know, it's always da dangerous, isn't it, to generalize too much when you don't know the detailed biology uh so okay there's a question from alice kazira uh, i'm I, I i'm just not even gonna finish that sorry alice is aphidony the only subfamily interested in aphids or more in general phytophagus hemiptera um yeah so the I think, yeah, so they are the only um, Braconid group that attack aphids, but there are, of course, other groups of parasitoids as well, which attack aphids, um, particularly, you know, some calcids. And there's a whole, there may, there's a whole ecosystem of aphid parasitoids, you know, there's se several sort of specialist hyperparasitoid groups as well. Um, yeah, it's re yeah, really interesting stuff going on in aphids, but no other group of ichneumonoids have gone on to aphids. Um, I think there is a, pretty reliable euphorine so sort of related not really uh euphorine record uh of a species being reared in so kids which is the nearest you can get to uh it's the nearest they get otherwise i think reconids thanks okay um a question from martin waller i have shed loads of smaller braconids slash ichneumonids from my moth trap pointed as this as they are small can i and if so get them to Gavin, somehow I can bring them to the Natural History Museum directly if that helps. Does he, his group, have the capacity to help amateurs get their catches ID'd? Yeah. Well, I wish I had a group. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> I've got a student. <laughs> There's, um, yeah, I have limited capacity. I shall be honest there. Um, I do try, obviously. Um, I do try and help and probably the best option is to come arrange a visit one day and then go through you can see what we can do with what you have um see what sort of things you have um yeah it's always possible but do you want to respond yeah. to that martin you've come 
Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll contact you offline if I can. I think I've got your email. Great, great. Yeah. Um, One thing I will... I've got some very interesting ones that I have positive identified. So, um, okay. On my record, you'll see that um, the smaller ones, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, you know, time cool. constraint. I'll, I'll contact you offline. I, I think some interesting stuff there. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, yeah, always probably better to turn up with the specimens that, you know, arranged to visit because I am awful at, do, you know, stuff arrives and I have great intentions and then it sits on my desk for a decade. I can imagine, I can imagine you're very busy. I, I, I'll email you and I'll arrange something. I can, I can put the specimens in without too much difficulty. I work in Amsterdam. So, uh, great. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. That, thanks, Martin. Okay, question from Lee. Um, what mechanism makes the ladybird seek out the Dinocampus coccinella cocoon it is protecting when you separate them? Is it chemical? They are not keen to give them up. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, we know there's a hormonal disruption going on. Um, but I must admit, I don't know in this case. Um, yeah, for a while I thought they were just sort of basically sewn in by the silk of the host but that's not true they can if yeah if like you say if you separate them they do go back so they've obviously got some weird uh <laughs> weird hormonal react um misguided yeah they've been misguided hormonally uh, i've no idea why but it's a remarkable adaptation and also i should this is one of the very few cases known where a braconid has been found sometimes to not kill the host because the dynamic camp I think if they're attacking large ladybirds, very at least in the lab, occasionally the ladybird has survived long enough to then go on and reproduce afterwards after attack. So, yeah, pretty cool. Well, yeah, I was going to ask that question actually: Do any of the hosts survive <laughs> and go yeah. on to to be successful? Just occasionally. All right. Um, oh, thanks, Martin. <laughs> oh, good. You got a lot there, Martin. <laughs> Great. Um. Okay, there's a, a question from um, Mohammed Athar Gol. Um, please have a quick review on the evolution of the host associations of Braconids. Maybe a few lines by Gavin would be great to hear. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I don't know if this, that's possible to have a quick review on that. Um, well, I could go back and start at slide one again. Um, <laughs> it's no, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> basically the, the, the classic story is. Braconids ancestrally were idiobiont ectoparasitoids of beetle larvae and then developed into endoparasitoids and exploited particularly Lepidoptera, but also several other groups. There's a lot of debate at the moment because some, some analyses and some researchers will say the evidence is in favour of most of some of the ectoparasitoid braconids evolving from the endoparasitoids, which sort of goes against expectations. But I still think there's a lot I think I don't think we know um, in which directions some of these changes have happened, and I think that we need more. Uh, it'd be really interesting to do a bit more sort of sensitivity analyses here to look at uh, how that to look at the direction of host shifts. But I think it's fairly, uh, I think it's probably fairly true to say that at some point quite early on, Braconids shifted into open feeding hosts, and then that was accompanied by quite a, a profound change in their biology to becoming. Uh, Coena biont endoparasitoids, but there's a, they're a really interesting group for host shifts, I would say, braconids, um, possibly more so than ichneumonids, just in that there's been more big changes in biology within fairly closely related lineages. I'll leave it at that, I think. Thank you, Gavin. Um, so uh, there's no um, more questions in the in the chat that I can see. Um, do you have any really horrible questions, Jose, that are going to be impossible <laughs> to answer? <laughs> um. I only want to say that you have a really great uh, speaker to, tonight or today because Gavin is one of the most respected and, and knowledgeable parasitoid experts in the world. So you, are, you have been lucky to have Gavin given the, the talk and... I have no criticism. On the contrary, I also learned a few things today, and and there are many other things that can be said about Braconics, But I think he has summarized things pretty well. And we really thank you for this great talk. Far too generous, Jose. That's um, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. We are very lucky to have Gavin. 
in the UK. And, well, as as you're you're a local, you're a we're all boy, aren't you? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what am I? What am I doing? Stuck down south of England for the last twenty odd years. Um, exactly. Come back to the northwest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shall I just quickly answer JB just to point out? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yes, for many years there's debate about, there's a little group called the Hybrizontiny or Paxillomatiny. Uh, there's a genus called Hybrizon, which is the most commonly collected thing. They attack ants. They're really weird little things. And they've been classified as Braconids in the past, Ichneumonids, their own family. I think they're now pretty sure they're just weird Ichneumonids. But yeah, that's a good example of a group which is shuttled between families. Alan oh, Masona course thanks Jose yeah weird little tiny wingless tropical things yeah okay well it's yeah it's, it's been a really fascinating evening Gavin and I'm sure people have really appreciated your very comprehensive answers as well to some yeah very what look like very challenging questions <laughs> great questions great questions, yeah, great questions. thank you